Uh, can folks see my screen? Yep. Awesome. All right. Uh, hey, Haika, thanks to, for that uh, amazing keynote. And uh, hi, everyone. I am Urja Gandhi. I am from uh, Microsoft Defender for Office 365 team. I'm a senior product manager on the team, um, mainly looking at uh, uh, prevention and protection of threats. And today our topic is uh, going to be on uh, protection against QR code phishing using MDO or Microsoft Defender for Office 365. And uh, also with me here, I have my colleagues, uh, Ajaz and Vipul. Uh, do you both want to give a quick introduction and then we can move on to agenda? Ajaz? Sure. Hey everyone, this is Ajaz Sheikh. I am part of the Microsoft Defender for Office 365 team. I'm a product manager too right now, currently owning the threat hunting investigation and hunting experiences like the Threat Explorer and the MDO Data into Advanced Hunting under Email and Collaboration Schema. Ripple, you want to go, go next? Sounds good. Thank you, Urja. Thank you, Ajaz. Hello, everyone. This is Whipple. I'm one of the senior product managers within Defender for Office 365. I specifically look at the space within end user resilience or colloquially also known as attack simulation and training. Uh, super excited to meet everyone today and hope you enjoy the session. Over to you, Urja. Thank you, Vipul. Thanks, Ajaz. Um, yeah, so uh, as you both mentioned, I'm also very excited to bring this topic to you and I'm pretty sure that this is uh, kind of top of mind for many of you. Uh, so going into the agenda, before we jump into the QR code phishing protection topic, uh, I will cover MDO's attack uh, prevention strategy and mainly kind of showcase on a very high level to you how our entire protection stack looks like, how complex it is, <laughs> and you'll see that in a moment. And then we'll come to the QR code phishing protection and what we have done as MDO and what we are still doing uh, to fight against this uh, attack vector. And then Ajaz will walk you all through some of the SOC experiences, which, uh, which our security operations center and SOC analyst teams can use in order to uh, remediate, hunt for, and take action on the QR code phishing. Uh, and then Vipul will talk about the end user awareness as uh, end user awareness is definitely important uh, for not just QR code phishing, but any phishing attacks in general. And then towards the end, uh, we'll leave uh, some time for Q&A. Uh, in the meantime, uh, please let your questions come through in the chat as well. I'll try to monitor the chat, but uh, if uh, we pull HS, if you both can, then you should as well. Otherwise, we'll have time at the end to go over uh, questions. OK, so with that, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, and regardless, I want to just touch upon a bit on what is MDO, right? Uh, what do we do as Microsoft Defender for Office 365? Uh, simply put, you can think about MDO as a cloud service, which basically helps to secure email and uh, collaboration tools such as Microsoft Teams, what we're using right now, against advanced threats like phishing, uh, malware, business email compromise, spam, and much more. And uh, this is kind of like the pre-breach side of uh, the attacks. And then speaking of uh, post breach a bit, uh, we also provide investigation, hunting, remediation capabilities. This is mainly for security teams to efficiently prioritize, identify, and investigate and respond to the threats. And it can vary across uh, multiple different threats. And it also uh, is important for MDO SOC analysts to get a picture into like M365D Defender suite wide uh, attack story. So it's really powerful for SOC analysts to have our post breach experiences. And then uh, for MDO, it also provides end user simulation and training, which we will go into as well. And then uh, just if you look at the right hand side uh, uh, image, uh, you'll see something called secure posture. The secure posture is uh, mainly a configuration based uh, uh, capability that we provide you for like making sure that your policies are intact, in some cases, like you don't even have to set up some policies and we have built in protection for you. So, uh, you know, depending on your need for your tenants or for your organization, 
uh, you can just onboard and say like give me the basic protection uh, give me advanced protection but i don't want to take care of the configuration as a SOC analyst, whereas some teams who are like, uh, you know, deep into configuration might want their own variations of their configuration. So that's how we make sure that you have a secure posture, no matter what your need is, whether you want uh, custom configuration or not, whether you want to just go ahead and take inbuilt uh, configuration and make sure that the threat protection is in place for your organization. And then MDO is available to both enterprise and consumer customers. So we give protection on both manner. Um, talking about what is our attack prevention strategy. So the way we think about this is in three parts. Uh, part number one is when we talk about uh, phishing, say, for example, right, or any attack for that matter, we treat it as uh, phishing is an adversarial problem. And we know that what is humanly seen as obvious is definitely designed to trick the system. And attackers are motivated and will get motivated to go across uh, those you know, obvious things that we see as humans. And then there are some, some things like, for example, in email, you might see a phishing email or a spam email, which is not that obvious, you know, where things like um, uh, safety tips come into picture and uh, MDO will present a safety tip to an end user and showcase like, hey, you know, this email looks like an impersonation, be aware before you proceed. Uh, and things like that. So mainly from a strategy point of view, we treat it as phishing is an adversarial problem. Secondly, uh, the the mindset that we operate with is that all security services, all security vendors will have misses, including us, including MDO. And there's this huge effort that we put into balancing what we call as false negative and false positives. So false negative is when MDO catches something uh, or does not get something, but the customer or the tenant thinks that, hey, this was a bad message and MDO should have caught it. That's a false negative or, a, or an FN. And a false positive is reverse when the message is believed to be good from a customer standpoint or a user standpoint. And MDO says uh, this message was bad. So that's an FP. Um, and, and in today's world, it has become super challenging to find this good balance between FNs and FPs without like, uh, you know, having a side effect of if we change something, for example, uh, I'll give you an example of our impersonation algorithm. It can be a bit complex when it comes to names of people and identifying impersonation across the world, like different cultures and countries and uh, places use names differently. And sometimes people have like four names in their name. Uh, some people have first name and last name, just two of them. Some people have first name, middle name, last name. And there are like four parts in the name. So it's very complex for the algorithm to generalize something, which is where this FN and FP balance is very important. Um, and then thirdly, which is the most and very much important is feedback. Feedback from customers, from our system, from our tenants is super important for us. So feedback is definitely paramount for us uh, from our users. And what we mean here is a couple things that there's uh, going to be numbers at scale. We look at things at scale and not just look at like one piece of feedback that one user has submitted somewhere and said, oh, this this message is bad. You know, maybe the user thought that this message is bad, but when you when the system actually analyzes the email headers or something, it's uh, not the case, uh, right? And and that's why like the safety lives in that numbers and the scale at which MDO or Microsoft operates at. Uh, and then the other thing is we also have uh, humans. Uh, we have some something called a grading team. We uh, who are human beings basically looking at the signals and uh, grading, labeling a message based on uh, identifiers that they can uh, they can they are trained to do. And of course, there is uh, ML models looking at the feedback of emerging threads. And uh, we take all this like feedback, uh, feed it into the ML systems, and then ML models slowly learn based on the customer feedback. So that's really important for us. And because we handle this data at so much scale, it's definitely our responsibility to handle it with care, uh, which is what uh, our strategy has been to do. So all that to say that uh, Continue submitting any false positives or false negatives that you see anytime as an end user. And if you are 
a SOC analyst team, then uh, make sure that you uh, encourage your end users to submit as well, and then you can submit uh, uh, false negative, false messages back to Microsoft as a system admin. Um, and a couple things that I wanted to cover again before we jump into the QR code topic. Uh, what is something that I would love to share with this group that we all can uh, help customers achieve the operational excellence? Whether you are an end user of an email service or Teams end user, just as we all are, right? Or whether you are a SOC team helping customers achieve the operational excellence. I think the four key things that are uh, top of mind for us as MDU is number one, assuming breach means never assuming perfect protection. As I talked about earlier, uh, FNFPs will happen. So if there's any security vendor out there telling you or telling any, any one of us that, oh, our FNFP rates are always zero, I definitely can guarantee they're lying. <laughs> no security vendor can say that. Um, and so just like, we, we need to operate, we all need to operate with this cultural shift of mindset that it will never be a perfect protection that anyone can get. But what do we do to make sure that if at all a breach were to happen, then what can what can be the best next action from there? Right? How can we limit limit the damage and things like that? So that's number one. Number two is users. Users are your most important asset. And end of the day, what do we do? As MDO, we work on protecting the humans. And um, if if at all even an email happens, it's basically after somebody's uh, assets or a company organization's uh, credentials or you know data, and maybe somebody's after a human being to get some money out of them, those type of things. So it is very important for users to be trained and stay aware of what the current risks are what the current uh, protection mechanism systems are in place and what should they do as an action. Um, again, this is where reporting or submitting to Microsoft is very important. Um, and then the third thing is, uh, we know that there will be always, you know, users who will, who will be backed up by the security operations teams. Uh, so for example, big companies, big organizations, even Microsoft, we have an internal SecOps team that uh, sets up the entire configuration for employees like us who uh, if we get an email or if we get uh, a phishing email or something, then the policies are set in place to not send that email over to my inbox. And before I know it, it's even sent to my junk folder or quarantine folder. And sometimes it's like even deleted. I don't even see it, right? So SecOps teams need these signals. And most importantly, they need automation to help them do their job to make sure that they take the right hunting actions, remediation actions against any type of threat, like not just phishing. And then machine learning models, as I said earlier, uh, feeding data to ML is very important and slowly ML will basically adapt to learning about the new threats and then go from there. Uh, and that's what we train our ML models constantly to do. Um, so one other insight I wanted to give into before we get into the QR code topic again, is the multi-layered threat protection stack that we have. Uh, I'm not going to get into details of this particular stack, but to give you an idea of how complex this is, right? Uh, we have many protection uh, capabilities on edge itself. So on edge, we do network throttling, we do IP reputation, domain reputation, and uh, things like that. Then comes the next layer, which is the sender intelligence. So based on if you know of these terms uh, such as P1 sender or P2 sender, um, or if you are aware of industry standards where there are uh, DKIM, DMARC, SPF, these sort of email authentication standards, uh, that's where we have protection using these signals, where mainly uh, we, we look at these signals and determine whether an email is authenticated or not, one, for one example. Then on top of the standard authentication system, we built something as industry first approach called as spoof intelligence. And spoof intelligence runs across your cross-domain, intra-org um, domains or emails as well. 
and then uh, outside of spoof intelligence we have uh, impersonation protection so that's also for brand impersonation for user impersonation domain impersonation um, and uh, more than that so um, just giving you an idea about what the layers are here then there is another layer for content filtering and content filtering is where we have for malware we have av engines which does the protection uh, ml models as i talked about earlier and then there's something called uh, clustering and fingerprinting that we do uh, and in our system what that hap what happens there is basically the system identifies certain amount of signals and clusters certain type of campaigns or certain type of emails into xyz categories so it knows based on xyz signals it says oh like this is a whole cluster of x type of attack and then it will bucketize into that and then a lot of uh, you know uh, different type of uh, protections run on that particular cluster to take out the bad actors so that it doesn't keep on growing or increasing um and also we have uh, url protection url blocking and uh, safe attachments so uh, if you heard about that term uh, for files and attachments and detonation of urls and files and this is the layer where we introduce something new called image processing which is what i've highlighted here uh, and that is where we have the QR code protection uh, that we have introduced within our content filtering layer. So outside of just QR code protection, QR code is one type of image, but we are looking at enhancing this image processing across uh, multiple different types of images. And today it's QR code, tomorrow it could be something else. Uh, and so we are looking deeply into what more can happen there and what uh, more type of protection we can put there. And then uh, post delivery protection, we have things like safe links. So if you have a URL, uh, despite your URL reputation blocking, let's say I sent I, I sent a Teams message to uh, someone uh, in chat and then I paste a URL in there. And when the recipient clicks on that URL, we have something called safe links protection at time of click. And so that safe links protection will kick in and identify whether that URL is good or bad. And if it's bad, then it will present you a block screen saying, hey, like you should not proceed on clicking further or going further to this URL. And with an option, of course, saying proceed anyway, if you trust this URL or if you want to take a risk. Uh, so that's one example. And then similarly, we have uh, uh, like campaigns that we identify for that. And all this protection is across all different Office clients that is supported, uh, OneDrive and SharePoint and on Teams for time of click protection. And then we have lastly uh, something called zero hour auto purge. So if things were to go wrong and if you have a bad email that lands in your inbox, then zap uh, or zero hour auto purge is what we call it. Zap will run automatically and then it can, once it knows that there was a bad email delivery, it can even remove that uh, email after delivery from the inbox. Uh, so, so just to give you an idea, like um, how complex this can be, wanted to make sure to show you this and you know talk about this on a high level and with that now i think we can jump into the topic for today which is the qr code phishing protection um i think if i if i think back uh, in last year 2023 september is around mid september is when uh, everybody across the industry started seeing this huge spike in qr code phishing attacks and uh, we as MDO knew about it. We were already on it. Our threat intel team had by then already identified that our telemetry showed about 23% uh, increase in this type of attack just within one week. Um, so you can imagine how this can, uh, you know, uh, scale up. And then uh, I think I, I, I cannot say very quickly, we put this protection out there. We took our time to analyze it and we, uh, you know, strategically didn't want to be in a position where we jump into something and do something which can ruin our stack or, you know, cause negative side effects. But very carefully, we identified and analyzed the attack. And by the time in December, uh, we created our QR code blog. I'll, I'll add a link to that later in the chat. Um, but by the time we created the blog, we were already ahead of making sure that, you know, we know where the attacks are going next after this wave. 
and uh, with just with plain heuristic based rules this was parallelly when our team was putting uh, a protection together in our uh, extraction mechanism or in our protection mechanism uh, we started writing heuristic rules so these heuristic rules are analyst rules basically which uh, day in and day out our analysts write all the time this is not something new this has existed from ever since many years and uh, we observed that like just by the mechanics of uh, heuristic rules uh, mdo was able to block more than 1.5 million messages per day and that was huge uh, and then slowly we started making sure that you know how do we want to do this extraction so our strategy was very simple but very powerful we said uh, we already have url protection and most of the times like when you scan this particular uh, qr code or uh, you know someone like the the main thing is going to be a particular qr code is lead you is going to lead you to a url at the end of the day so what we did was we started extracting with this image detection we started extracting a url from each qr code in email body and then that url would be passed to our uh, regular url protection stack uh which does its own thing and make sure that if this is a bad url then it's going to block it otherwise it's going to proceed and so that significantly helped us uh, decrease the attacks to even an extent where i could say that what used to be in december 2023 a qr code phishing uh, increase that we had seen equal to about 3 million per day went down by march 2024 to less than 180k so we could clearly like tell that we had compelled attackers by that time to move on to something else because again still the attacks kept on coming kept on coming but our system kept on taking them down and block them down so attackers figure out that there's no more point in sending these qr code based um, email body uh, attacks anymore and we could see the decline uh, right away by march and then we knew where where it was going it was going to go in attachments and that's exactly what happened and so it went into um, an attacker moving on from an email body to inserting a qr code or embedding it into an attachment which may be a ppt file or maybe um, you know a dot eml file so we've already uh, released the feature where qr code attack uh, qr code extraction is happening from an attachment from dot uh, email uh, but pdf is something we are working on uh so that should come later um i don't have the exact timelines but just to give you an example of right how this how complex this could be uh we've seen qr codes being uh within the email body embedded within embedded url in the message body with the qr code and then the qr code as part of the attachment and now uh, i think even after this wave or within while we were in this wave we saw that the whole black and white a combination of qr code changed to blue and attackers started sending like blue qr codes or red qr codes and then we quickly put uh, you know uh, a protection in place or a feature in place to make sure that uh, those are handled as well so all in all um, i can say that yes the attack was uh, a huge one when it started slowly you know got down and uh, we completely disrupted it and compelled the attackers to move away from it uh, but we won't stop there like as i said qr code is just one image and we are working on ocr and uh, further image recognition through through our protection stack any uh, questions or comments before we move on to the sock experiences Oh, I'm seeing the chat as well. Okay, nothing. Um, okay, then Ajas, uh, off to you. Thank you, Urja. Hello, everyone. As we have seen in the very first slide about what MDO is, we have seen the prevention and detection part of QR code. Then next comes the investigation, response, and hunting part, which is covered into the SOC experiences flow that we have. And specific to QR codes, there are four things that a user can do through our SOC experiences. The first is analyzing the clean and malicious emails which had a QR code in them. This is nothing but a true positive or a true negative scenario. So security teams can go and check the mail flow volume from where the emails are coming in, who are the sender, who are all the recipients, how the emails have been uh, 
uh, how the QR codes have been embedded in the email, whether it is in the body of the email or it is in the attachment. Then next is managing the FNFP workflows. If there are any false positive or false negative emails, then which had a QR code in them, then security teams can respond to emails or they can submit the emails to us through the submission workflows. There are other scenarios as well where a lot of our SOC experiences are very well versed with investing in hunting capabilities, which are mainly through the Threat Explorer advanced hunting, where they can proactively go and hunt for emails which had a QR code in them. And lastly is the custom detection rules through advanced hunting, which we are going to cover later, which provides the capability to automatically remediate the email, even uh, if it has any type of threat, not only just the QR code, but all types of email, all types of threats. Can we go to next slide, Ucha? All right. The first experience is the Threat Explorer. This is a user completely UI friendly experience, which provides a lot of filtering capability, lots of data sets covering from emails, which, uh, which are nothing but all emails in the tenant domain. The emails categorized by malware, fish, email campaigns, malicious files, and end user clicks as well. And all of its capabilities, the latest enhancement is the ability to search for an email which had a QR code embedded in it through the filter called the URL source. So users can directly go into Explorer and search for the emails via this URL source filter, which can be extended to identifying the threats associated for that URL. Users can apply the first level of filtering as the QR code through URL source. And then there are other filters like URL threat or the sender recipient details to drill down the search further and take any remediation action. Through Explorer, users can remediate the email. They can also trigger investigation, automated investigations, or they can submit an email to Microsoft. Can we go to next slide? Through Explorer, you can get a list of emails which had a QR code in them, but if you want to dig deeper into what exactly was the content of the email or what was the threat identified, what was the latest delivery location, override sources, you can go to email entity page, which is a very comprehensive view of all of the metadata of the email. This experience allows you to see the timeline view as in when the email was delivered, what all consecutive actions have been taken on the email. These actions can be anything ranging from remediation to submission through any zap events or any of the system action that have been taken by MDO. It also gives you a deeper insight into the metadata, as I said, which covers the URLs and attach attachments also. In the URL section, now users can see the QR code association as in any of the URL which was extracted from a QR code in an email that will have a source as QR code. Users can also see the detonation details for the URL. Say if any of the URL was found malicious through our detonation detections. What we do is we open the URL in a sandboxed environment. We take the screenshot. We take the behavioral details if there are any URL chains as well. All of these details can be seen by just clicking on the URL. It will open a flyer which will give you all of the detonation details along with the screenshot as well. Uh, screenshot of the landing page and lot of the lots of the behavioral details of the URL and the URL chain as well. With this detail, what users can do is they can see the overall flow of how the attack has been happening. What are the steps that the attackers have been taken in? Whether it's at the first stage that the attacker is trying to trying to get details from credentials from the user, or if there's any other type of attack, or there are any certain URL chains, any redirects, which later comes to a page where the users are asked to share their credentials or some other things. That's where the email entity detonation details comes into picture. These details can also be used to add entry to the tenant allow block list, which is nothing but the uh, what we call it table. So table entries are nothing but the items that you want to add, which our system should take into consideration while delivering the email. It can be the sender details, URLs, file names, sender domains, IPs. All of these details can be added into the table. And for that, if the security teams need a deeper insight, they can check the email entity page. 
Can we go to next slide? The next one is the advanced hunting, which is a XDR capable product, which has data spanning across the identity data, alerts data, our MDO data under the email and collaboration schema and the devices data as well. So an attack can be multi-dimensional. It will start from an email, but it will go into devices, it will go into identity. So for that, we have an XDR capable product, which is advanced hunting. And through advanced hunting, you can join these data sets and do a thorough end-to-end -end hunting scenario. From MDO side, we have the data into the email URL info table. All of the URL extracted from the email body through QR code. You will have a association as a URL location goes to QR code. Users can run KQL queries in advanced hunting and they can investigate and hunt for this email. Advanced hunting also lets you proactively hunt for emails through joining the different data sets. If users are not comfortable with writing KQL queries, we also have a completely user experience based UI based hunting experience, which is called the query build query builder. You can create a new query with an option as build uh, in a query builder experience, which will let you select the options through uh, drop downs and you'll have a completely user experience based uh, hunting scenario covered end to end. Let me go to next slide. The last one is the custom detection rule. It's an extension to the advanced hunting scenarios where users can write KQL queries and set them up as a custom detection rules. So these detection rules are nothing but uh, rules that are running at a constant frequency through the defined KQL queries. Once the rule has been run, it can trigger an alert. The alert will have the list of emails that are matching with the criteria that the user has set in. And it also provides you an option to automatically remediate the email as well. Say if user wants to delete those emails, say if you are writing a Q detection rules with emails having QR codes in them from a sender XYZ, you can run the rule at a constant frequency. And once there are any matching emails, the system will automatically take the remediation action and those emails will be deleted or any action will be taken as per the user's preference. We also have a capability where the rules can be run in a continuous manner, but the queries should be directed. There should not be any joins in them. Joins query can the queries with joins can also be run at a set frequency, but to run a query at a constant uh, in a continuous manner, the query should not contain any of the joins. And that's all from my side. Over to you, Vipul. Sounds good. Uh... Just giving a shout out. Do we have any questions still at this stage? Okay. Uh, feel free to put any questions in the chat as well. Or if you want to raise your hand over Teams, please do that. Sounds good. Thank you, Urja. Thank you, Ajaz, for walking us through the prevention and the SOC workflows uh, over here. Um, I think Urja touched upon this in the beginning of her presentation that when we think about protecting the human, how it is a multi pronged strategy. It's a combination of our investments in protection and detection speed. It's a combination of investments in our SOC workflows surrounded by a consolidated and simplified secure posture. And equally important within this strategy is the notion of end user resilience or making sure your humans are resilient against these attacks. So our, if we can go to the next slide, our focus towards enabling end user resilience has been through attack simulation training. It's a phishing risk reduction tools where we enable the organizations, the admins to drive behavior change through a very integrated story in the form of creating really authentic phishing simulations through a DIY experience where you can take advantage of the content that we provide or you can craft your own custom content. We provide a very integrated, targeted, personalized learning experience to end users as part of our efforts. So you can take advantage of that or you can integrate with your own systems as well. It is available as part of your standard plan two or E5 licenses and is available across multitude of environments as well as sovereign clouds for you to go ahead and take that. Uh, so in QR code, uh, Ujjay, if we can move to the next slide. Thank you. In QR code, there are basically two investments that we are looking to make. 
One is around simulations where you can educate your and test your users, assess your users in response to QR code simulations. As part of that, you will have the ability to insert QR code when you're designing your email templates. You can use or test your users against a variety of techniques, whether it's a credential harvest or a link to malware or a drive by URL based attacks. You can track user response, whether they read the email, whether they scanned the QR code, whether they got compromised or did they report the message, which is the right thing to do. You can always take advantage of uh, our integrated flows, for example, notifications, landing page experiences to provide that very targeted nudge and learning experience to end users. And we also have integrated trainings in the form of two sets. One is a how-to guide, which covers QR code payloads and QR code information in a lot more detail. This is a very lightweight uh, training experience where you can deliver content to end users within the Outlook. So you can deliver content, you can deliver details, and end users can read within Outlook. And we have provided a how-to guide experience focusing on QR code attacks, recommendations on how to mitigate and respond against these QR code attacks. Uh, we also have two micro learnings, video based content that we have worked with our partner to provide to all the attack submission training users. As part of that, the two trainings that we have are malicious digital QR codes and malicious printed QR codes. These are training present across more than 30 plus languages where we uh, help user understand that if they are receiving a QR code within an email or if they are seeing a QR code printed or receiving it over Teams or multiple other channels, what can they do to take uh, recognize those forms of attacks? What are the indicators they should consider as form of that? And then they can go ahead and take the right action in response to those attacks. So as part of this comprehensive story, you can go ahead and design authentic QR code simulations to assess your users and then drive awareness through a very integrated training experience. Uh, as a quick recap, this is already available in case you are an MDO customer and you can take advantage of our SOC workflows, our assessment workflows, as well as prevention story and deliver a very rounded uh, comprehensive strategy. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we come to a close of the session. Just wanted to understand if we have any questions on the prevention side, on the SOC side, or user awareness side, I think there are a couple of questions in the chat that we have addressed, but feel free to come off mute and uh, take over questions. Thanks, Vipul. Thanks, Ajas. Um, yes, I think the question around the detonation in the chat was, is the URL detonation constant across all incoming emails? Example, if there are 1,000 incoming emails which are part of a phishing campaign, will all of the emails have URL detonation applied to them? where there are QR codes or URLs on the body or attachments included in the email. Uh, Ajas, you answered the detonation details part of the SOC experience. Uh, I'm going to answer the prevention part of it from a detonation standpoint. Um, so I will say um, ideally, yes. The All the emails should be uh, caught by our QR code protection, if that's what the question is about. Um, but again, like I, I was telling earlier that uh, it depends whether what may seem as an obvious QR code phishing may not actually be a QR code phishing. So even though, let's say a customer or a tenant is experiencing 1000 or 500 or something of the emails that look similar by a human eye to us as, hey, this looks exactly like the same other email, right? Uh, there may be nuances to that particular email where it may not, may or may not be uh, caught by the system thinking that it is actually a phishing email or not. But on a in in principle, yes, every email goes through scanning. It's not like uh, some of the emails don't go through scanning. There is a, a criteria that we have internally on our end where we determine if this if this message is supposed to be sent to our sandboxing environment or not for detonation. And so that criteria comes into picture. And if the message uh, meets that particular criteria, I cannot share those details uh, from a confidentiality standpoint. But if it meets the criteria and if it goes to the detonation system, then uh, it should be taken care of by the detonation system, whether it's in body or attachment doesn't matter. So I hope that answers the question. If not, then uh, please feel free to come off mute and uh, happy to discuss that further. 
Thanks, Urja, for that. Uh, I just wanted to find out, the reason why I'm asking this question, it's now me coming back to the point that you spoke about zero hour auto purge, right? Um, in the event that I've, I've, I've experienced some, some cases whereby you'd find that an email has a URL, but it didn't undergo URL uh, detection scanning whatsoever, because when I check it, I'd find that under URL, detection technologies that be just the dash there and then when you take the url that you found on the email go scan it you find that it's actually a credential phishing <laughs> campaign uh, that ended up getting delivered sometimes you find that zapping would then be applied maybe a few minutes later but in some cases you find that the email was initially delivered a user would then report it using whatever channels that you've got in the organization to report that email and then you'd find that email there's some lag as well in terms of they receive the email maybe let's say at four o'clock they report the email five minutes later you still can't see it in the console it's as if it's still processing when you're looking at it from a defender point of view uh, and 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 that's why I, I came to ask the question to say that all right do, do they all go through that scanning in the event that they do not go through that url scanning uh then what's 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 the what's the recourse to take then should we then maybe be raising that with support to say hi guys this email came through without being scanned and it actually is a phishing url yeah yeah i think uh Th that uh, is the right approach that in case if you feel or if you see that there was um, a URL phishing attempt, but it did not go through the URL scanning uh, component. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot answer here because I'll have to take a look at that specific case, yeah. uh, but I cannot generalize it. But you're right, like the approach is right. In that case, it should be submitted back to Microsoft and then the system can rescan the message and go through what happened there and come back with another analysis of the entire verdict of whether you know uh, it missed it or was it uh, accurately not sent for URL scanning for some some reason like maybe you know the maybe the uh, tenant or admin had suppressed it and maybe there was something in the policy which said allow this no matter what or um, mm -hmm. something of that nature so there could be multiple factors associated to it but that's why that submission you mentioned is the really important key point uh, to make sure that uh, you know it it is actually submitted to the system. And then if it's truly a miss on the system's part, then uh, as uh, you know, as we expect the ML models to learn more from there, and uh, over time the ML models will make sure that that's accounted for. All right, awesome stuff. Thanks a lot, Urja. Yep. Thank you. I don't see any other questions in the.